Good afternoon, everyone. We are a group from the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank here today to present to you the latest developments on administration plans and a National Infrastructure Bank plan for financing all of our nation's infrastructure. I'm going to be joined here today by Stan Forzik from, uh, on our board from a previous Amtrak official and Jack Hanna, who also works on infrastructure projects in the Portland and Oregon area. And, and I would like to show you a couple of slides uh, to discuss where we are today in our efforts to finance our infrastructure projects in America. So the, the bill we have before Congress to create a national infrastructure bank has just recently been reintroduced. It is H.R. 3339, and what it would do would be to create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the United States. The reason we need such a bank is we have not been able to finance infrastructure through the federal budget or through state and local budgets. And as a result, our infrastructure spending has fallen very low compared to the size of our economy. What I'd like to point out to you is that this infrastructure bank although it's being touted around in the press and in the legislature, it is very different than other proposals to finance infrastructure through banks or revolving funds. This particular bank is large enough at $5 trillion to cover all of the gap and does not require things like public-private partnerships uh, and is flexible in how it gives out its lending terms. It's, it's designed to cover everything that has not been financed through state and local budgets in the federal budget over many years. The proposal is to lend $5 trillion, as I pointed out, and the bank would do this by acting as a, uh, like a commercial bank to give out loans. It capitalizes itself from the private uh, market. It doesn't require uh, any appropriations from Congress to get the bank started. What it aims to do is to cover all of the financing gap that has been identified by the American Society of Civil Engineers, who say over a 10-year period, we need at least $2.6 trillion to fix all of our nation's infrastructure. That's above and beyond what the federal budget and state and local budgets have been providing and financing so far. And it has some really large numbers in it. $1.2 trillion for surface transportation, $1.1 trillion for water infrastructure, uh, we want the bank to be able to cover all of this infrastructure. And in addition, we've added on components of our own that we think are very, very important to our economy, uh, affordable housing. We put in $1 trillion just for a high-speed rail system all across the United States. Of course, broadband everywhere and large mega water projects to a uh, to ameliorate drought in the southwest and mid, uh, north midwest regions of the country that are really striking hard at the agriculture sector. Um, I'd like to just compare uh, this proposal to uh, a, recent, a recent proposal but from the Senate, a bipartisan plan, which would also provide infrastructure financing, extra infrastructure financing through the budget. That plan is only for five years. Uh, it's maybe 580 billion uh, if it winds up being that, uh, that full amount. And it will cover new money for transportation, but still not enough. And a little bit of money, new money for water, but way, way short of what's needed. And then uh, some uh, other projects that are being covered in the, in the power and uh, hazardous waste areas. And then a small amount for broadband, still not enough to cover the full amount. Um, uh, one of our other speakers, Jack Hanna, is going to go over the political side of whether or not this, uh, this, this bill could move its way through Congress and actually get uh, passed. Uh, but I'd just like to point out right here that this, this bill is simply not large enough to cover all of our infrastructure needs. Our National Infrastructure Bank, however, will be able to cover all of those projects and financing. The other aspect of the National Infrastructure Bank is we will have a concrete plan for putting more rail into our transportation mix and having the funding ready to pay for it. So we'll cover a high-speed rail project all across the United States. We've earmarked a trillion dollars just for that, and we'll build out more passenger rail and freight rail so that we can move more passenger and freight by rail rather than roads. Uh, which are congested 
and airports, which are congested, and both of those other means too use a whole lot of fuel. Rail is a very uh, efficient way to move uh, um, passengers and goods and save um, save on uh, CO2 emissions. So we have a concrete plan for that. And then in addition, as I said, we want to cover water projects uh, in, the, in the Southwest and up in the North where, there, where there's drought. Uh, we want to do economic planning so that we can move along economic corridors. All of these things will require a long-term institution to provide the funding, not just a five-year funding allotment, but a long-term permanent institution. And uh, then we can stimulate economic growth in the United States and hire millions of new workers, train them for these jobs and get this job, get our build back best and get uh, our economy working again. Dan, would you like to say something about uh, rail and infrastructure needs in the country? Uh, as you are well aware, there are two separate and distinct uh, plans that are out there. Uh, not funding, but plans. And they are significantly lower, as Alpeca has said, than what we believe is the real figure to do all the infrastructure. Let's look at the implications of choosing either one of them and doing it finding the funding somehow, or even say the bank funds it, uh, versus what happens to the rest of the infrastructure that's out there. It's common knowledge that we haven't fixed our infrastructure for several decades, maybe six, maybe seven, maybe more than that. And what that means is the life expectancy of those assets depletes every year that it's, it is in existence. And, and what that means is, all right, we have decided because we as a country have decided because we don't have the money to put in new infrastructure and we don't have uh, accelerated funds to work on the operations and maintenance of those things, uh, those, those pieces of infrastructure that we've deferred the maintenance so that we've accelerated the disintegration process of uh, those assets. And what's happening is, is we haven't done anything. And if we don't do something soon, that acceleration process will continue. And it will continue to the point where safety uh, becomes an issue. Look at what happened last week in Florida, a 40 plus year old building collapsed with people in it. That's a safety issue. Does anyone, just think about this, does anyone really realize that in every township and every municipality across the United States, something goes wrong every day? You don't hear about it unless you live in that township, but something happens because we have deferred O&M. And what does deferred O&M really mean? Deferred maintenance. It really means that we've depleted our budgets to their lowest level and we don't fix everything when they should be fixed. The building in Florida was inspected three or four years ago and it was determined that it was in bad shape, but nobody did anything about it. No one has any money. And think about this, Alfeca mentions the fact that we're gonna put people to work by doing, uh, by putting in the infrastructure bank and doing all projects across the country. We've deferred maintenance. That does not mean that we fired people, although we've lowered the budget. It means we haven't hired people when we should have hired them and have them trained to work in certain areas. And that's why we have high unemployment. We have people sitting around most of the time, not energetic enough to go out and seek work. So we're not hiring people and we're certainly not firing them. We're betwixt and between about what should be done. But let's say one of the plans comes out and miraculously we find a way to fund it. And that's, we'll say it's an even trillion dollars. That means there's still five, six, seven trillion dollars of uh, infrastructure that still needs to be fixed. So we are delaying that maintenance. We're not committing to a long-term uh, infrastructure program that should last 10 or more years. 
the legislation that is in front of Congress says there is no sunset clause in this bank. So it would go on for a longer period of time and all infrastructure would be done. The last infrastructure bank was FDR's and it came to term in 1957. Imagine if you will, that it didn't come to term. Would we have the infrastructure problems that we have now? Would we have water systems that are failing? Would we need commuter rail across the country? Would we need high-speed rail? The sad part about it is we've allowed our infrastructure to decay, we've deferred maintenance, and we're not improving the situation whatsoever. We did not do anything for the start of the 21st century insofar as infrastructure is concerned. It can't be a five-year program. We certainly would enjoy a 10-year program, but that still is not gonna get everything done. So we need an infrastructure bank that will last a long period of time and put everything in its place. We have to do this because we have to better the country for the generations that are coming. It cannot be the same way for them that it is right now or within the last 20 or 30 years. And now I'd like to turn my time over to Jack Hanna, who's gonna give you the political ramifications of the legislation for the National Infra Infrastructure Bank. Thank you very much, Stan. And I want to just touch upon for a moment the themes and topics that uh, uh, Alfeca and Stan just talked about uh, and characterized uh, the state of the country in this fashion and manner. The American public already has an emerging understanding and, and an intuitive sense of our infrastructure deficits that are occurring and it's creating anxiety and rightfully so, it's impeding our economy from being able to go forward. We have bridges in Cincinnati failing, that's uh, constricting the amount of trans goods and transportation that we have through an important corridor. In Arkansas, we have the I-40 bridge failing. The same consequence, we have the electric electrical grids in Texas and in California in crisis. We have local governments and communities all over the United States that have roads and bridges that are failing or about to fail. Alfeca and Stan have just reviewed the trillions of dollars that we need to invest in our infrastructure that is established and documented by the American Society of Civil Engineers annual report showing that, uh, that we need upward of five and six trillion dollars over the past, the next 10 years in order to address our infrastructure needs. Where are we politically on this? We have two tracks that are going. First is the one where we have a bipartisan effort in the United States Senate in order to have some kind of common agreement between the political parties to pass legislation to address some infrastructure needs. What is the amount? It's about $580 billion, which is about one-tenth of what we need in order to address the needs of the country. How are they intending to pay for that? That answer has not yet been disclosed. And we are only two or three months away from the drop dead date of when we're going to be able to pass this legislation, any legislation before the fall recess. Some of the ideas that they're kicking around for just the $580 bipartisan bill is $70 billion of cuts as far as unemployment benefits are going to be used and paid in the future. Uh, experts say that's really only going to be about $35 billion, and that will adversely impact unemployment benefits for those that are needed. The Republicans have said no new taxes, no increased income taxes as far as corporations are concerned, and if there's going to be any payment of it, it's going to have to be through user fees. Biden and the Democrats have said no taxes that are going to be assessed against any group of people earning income of $400,000 or less. So there is a deadlock. There's, there's no answer that has been put forth 
by either of the Democrats or the Republican senators that are participating in the negotiations and the Biden administration as to how this is going to be paid. They're kicking around ideas that they're going to take they're going to take 65 billion from uh, the sale of a 5G broadband that occurred in February. But that, that's a one shot deal and it's not absolutely agreed to yet. Uh, there's an idea about 80 billion dollars in in using the pandemic relief. Uh, uh, to be applied to the $580 billion. But it's not been mutually agreed to between the parties. Uh, $6 billion are said to be coming out of the strategic reserve sale of oil uh, that they're setting up to take place. But that will need to be replaced on the back end. There's talk of dynamic scoring, quote unquote, which is the increased economic benefits that are derived from having more efficient infrastructure construction uh, employed to increase our efficiencies. Yes, but uh, that's never been employed in the past. That will happen, but you first have to get a bill passed. There's no funds that they are coming up with to pay for that. That's step number one, $580 billion. What's going to happen for the other two pieces of the infrastructure plan that Biden's administration has, has come up with of a trillion, a trillion two each for, for the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan? They need to come up with big time money in order to pay and finance for those projects and those goals. And we have a Senate. And the only way that that can be passed politically is through a reconciliation bill. And that requires every one of the Democrats in the Senate to join in approval of that bill. That includes Senator Manchin and Senator Simina uh, from Arizona and Manchin from West Virginia to stay on board. They are not going to go through a deficit financing package and proposal that is tentatively being uh, floated and considered in order to pass the legislation. So. How does the bill get passed? The only way that this problem politically can be addressed is by adoption of our infrastructure bank proposal in, in H.R. 3339. And the reason why that's the case is we do not have deficit financing. We go to the private sector and ask those people that hold treasuries to pledge them as collateral for the bank to the tune of about $50 billion a year that very easily can be raised in order for us to be able to lend out $500 billion a year over the course of 10 years to get $5 trillion of our infrastructure improved. That is done in a way that we don't have a deficit financing piece included in our infrastructure plan so that we hold the votes that we need from the Democrats uh, that may be anxious about deficit financing and may even be able to entice some Republicans too. The reason that we think this can work is it's occurred before. It's been employed uh, at the very beginning of our country's creation by Alexander Hamilton. Uh, John Quincy Adams employed it in order to build our rail, our, our canals and our ports. Lincoln uh, used it in order for the transcontinental uh, railroad financing. FDR, of course, through the New Deal, used it to lift our country out of depression and prepare ourselves for World War II. This is the vehicle and the tool which succeeds in holding a political coalition that is going to be needed to successfully pass an infrastructure package. The chickens are coming home to roost. They've been playing games with this uh, over the past six months in the sense that no one's tipped their cards as to how this is going to be paid. And, and the reason why is the whole set of cards, house of cards collapses once they do, except and unless they employ the National Infrastructure Bank. So I urge each and every one of you uh, to review the contents and the information in our website. It explains exactly how this can happen and why it should happen. And I suggest to you politically, it is the only way that it is going to happen in order for us to address the critical needs that our country faces going forward.